Welcome to The Career Report. I appreciate you taking the time being here today. We're going to be getting into, well, we're going to get eye to eye with apartment supply as producer of The Great Report, Matt Bosnagel. So says, looking at a couple different reports, one from John Burns Research and Consulting titled, How to Ride the Apartment Supply Wave, well, surfs up. And then from Apartment List Renter Migration Report 2024, from RealPage, their economists pick for their favorite apartment markets of 2024. And then a really detailed piece from Fannie Mae, their 2024 multifamily market outlook titled Instability Expected as Skies Remain Cloudy. Well, as j Powell said, we are attempting to navigate by the stars under cloudy skies. Let's see if those clouds are breaking at all. See if we can see what the next couple of months, maybe a year is going to look like. No crystal ball, though. Strap in because if you're a multifamily investor, active, passive, anywhere in the capital stack, you're in the right spot. Every week, we're breaking down all the latest research reports, articles, data for the multifamily industry, housing, macro economy, help you make some really good investment decisions. Again, clear up that sky, see where, which direction the winds are blowing. All right, let make sure you've liked this video. Subscribe, hit the bell icon so you get alerts, keep you up to date. Without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome back to The Report, joined again by Dr. Matt Bosnagel, Director Hello. of Communications and Marketing here at Gray Capital, producer of The Gray Report. We're recording live from the beautiful Gray Capital Studios and headquarters in cloudy Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> Matt, really excited to talk about this stuff. This John yeah. Burns piece, again, it doesn't give us all the answers, but a lot of good data, a lot of good data in general. Mm -hmm. So we talked about in previous episodes, Investor sentiment is changing a little bit. People yeah. are a little bit getting a little bit maybe antsy to make some decisions. Some deals are popping up, but still the the next six, eight, six, nine, 12, 18 months still uncertain, especially mm -hmm. apartment supply being the strongest headwind that's yeah. pushing it against multifamily performance. Synthesizing all of this, you've gone through all these research reports. I know that John's John Burns' piece was the most clicked on report from the Gray Report newsletter that went out recently. You put it at the top of the list here, but kind of synthesizing all the information you're seeing in terms of supply, investor sentiment, what, what's your feeling for the multifamily market this week, given what you've read? It looks like that if, if we were talking about this last year, maybe a lot of discussion would be, do we invest or not? Mm. And this implication, you know, we're looking at all these different markets, it's where to invest. So maybe people are warming up to the idea of investing. Oh, or maybe I'm trying to, you know, wish cast a little bit. No, I but. think that makes sense. So because that makes a lot of sense because last year we were dealing with, everyone was dealing with capital market, yeah. you know, issues. Interest rates were rising. So it wasn't, you could have had a decent looking deal in a decent looking market, but that execution risk was so high because, you know, your interest rate might move like a whole percentage point or more mm -hmm. between when you identify the deal and you actually close on it. Yeah. So even if it's a deal you wanted to do, you, it was hard to even actually do it unless it was like an assumable rate loan that you knew what interest rate you were going to get. Mm -hmm. So now it's more of, okay, there's, you know, not absolute certainty on where interest rates are going to be, but there's uh, definitely the consensus that rates aren't um, going up too much, yeah. at least especially so for Fed funds rate. Ten-year treasury, I don't think we really know. I mm -hmm. think people are maybe a little too comfortable with the idea that it's going to go down instead of going up again before it goes down. We don't yep. know, but more of a feeling like it's going to be moving down, more of a feeling like cap rates are going to compress again over time. You know, I don't think we're at the bottom yet, but maybe we're getting yep. close. So it's just, we're, we're in a, it's a different place. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, where is the growth going to be? Mm -hmm. If you're going to, people want to make a decision. They have capital on the sidelines. They want to get into real estate because prices are down. Was, but what markets do you go into? Because some of the markets that everyone thought were great mm -hmm. are doing the worst. Well, and then one of the articles that maybe it was a number two clicked on, one that I thought that would get the most attention was an article that was speculating on whether prices have hit bottom. Yeah. And it was talking about how maybe prices have bottomed out of the public markets, yeah. but in private markets, you know, is is the public market activity a leading indicator? And a lot of times it is. Yeah. And so, so is it, but is it six months? Yeah, is it, yeah. you know, usually the timing for you know, sure. is it three, six months, nine months? And we've seen, I mean, the 
how slow the private markets, especially real estate, how mm -hmm. slow those markets move. And I think the one thing that people are, are a little too optimistic on is that even if rates start moving downward, mm -hmm. um, even if they move down quite a bit, it doesn't mean cap rates move down yeah. right away. I mean, they certainly, there, there's correlation, It's but it's not lockstep. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Ken, if we've learned anything, I mean, they're just slow moving ships. Yeah, well, I hope the real estate industry is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and my cynical expectation is that cap rates will be quicker to compress than they have been to ex to expand because everyone's happy. Well, at least sellers are much more likely to yeah. kind of get back in, and you know buyers may be a little bit more bullish, and mm -hmm. rates are more favorable, and in general, there's going to be more of a risk on sentiment. Yeah, but it, it, what's what's keep thinking about is you know still we don't have like a large spread of where you know. Cap rates can go back down if interest rates go back down and mm -hmm. you can still get decent returns. But most folks don't think interest rates are going to get down that low. And so there's yeah. how much room is there for cap rates to really compress to maintain yeah. the returns that people want to see? Or is there just going to be so much money chasing deals that it's just going to force returns down? Yeah, that it was. there was a CRE analyst post on LinkedIn a couple of days ago that, or maybe just yesterday, that that illustrated that same thing is was like there's still a large gap even now yeah. between you know the expectation of people's cap rate the bid ask gap basically yeah. it's still pretty big and like it's moving like it's moving down and maybe getting a little smaller but yeah. it still exists yeah. yeah yeah and so i think that i remember we talked about this around november of last year and there was a lot of discussion. It seemed like people were kind of trying to justify themselves. And there was a little bit of like, well, no, it's not cap rate. Cap rates aren't everything. There's like, no, but you can, you don't understand. I'm trying to add all this value. Well, you know, yeah. you can say that, but the larger trends may, may not be, may not fit your specific circumstance. Yeah. That, I mean, we were also in an environment where, you know, you could have a large company, you know, not in real estate, you know, public company or, you know, a startup and not be generating any profits, you yeah. know, and having no earnings mm -hmm. and receive a lot of money. And you know, those days are gone. It's the same thing yeah. with, you know, some value add deals of like, there could be a good opportunity, but you can't assume that someone's going to pay up for the future, the upside and pay mm -hmm. such a low cap rate. Well, that's what was happening really 20 kind of 18 through then, you know, 2022 is that instead of getting like a good deal on an older property that you're going to fix up and mm -hmm. force appreciation. What started happening is buyers kept, you know, essentially they were more willing to pay a higher price being confident that they could force value mm -hmm. uh, and that cap rates were going to continue to compress. And you would always just have one more buyer that would be willing to just pay up a little bit more. Yep. And so the upside ended up being priced in further and further and further. So you had to pay a, you know, a five cap or a four and a half cap on an older deal because some other buyers like, well, I'm going to, you know, move rents by, you know, $300 and mm -hmm. I'm going to force appreciation and I'm going to take this $20 million property and turn it into a $35 million property. So I'm willing to pay a couple million dollars more in a low, I don't really care what the cap rate is because yep. I'm just going to do this, execute this business plan. Well, you know, there's a lot less speculation on what you can achieve right now. And again, going back, it got to a point because we started, we were doing a lot of value add in 2015 through 2018. And then they got to the point of we were paying lower cap rates or in the market, the value add deals, the older properties needed more work that were more risky. We're asking a much lower cap rate than the stabilized deals. Mm -hmm. And then once you were factoring in the business plan to the value add deal, like the returns were looking very similar to more yeah. of a core plus opportunity that was stabilized. You didn't have to do that much work and it was just throwing off decent returns. The whole reason the value add made sense was you were getting, you know, outsized returns, good cash flow and a really high equity multiple. Mm -hmm. But when the equity multiples and the IRRs and the cash flow started looking the exact same as a stable, a newer, nicer, stabilized deal, it made less sense to do value add deals. Yeah. But I think that's kind of shifting back a little bit, but still there, there's not the confidence everywhere to say, yeah, go and buy a four cap mm -hmm. and because you're going to sell it again for a four and a half cap and sell the dream again to somebody else. Yeah. Like you, your, your business plan has to make sense without somebody going out 
on a limb and, you know, using the greater fool theory of like, well, someone else is going to, you know, just buy into this. Yeah, I was homeless dream. like, I, yeah, and that's what I was wondering. It's like, I bet people bought these value add and they didn't do anything and they just resold it. Resold well, that's what ended up happening is I mean, everyone had a plan to, you mm -hmm. know, add value and renovate units, but there was so much rent growth. You were either getting your premiums without outlaying CapEx. Yeah. So it's always a higher ROI if you can get a $200 in rent premium without spending any money than mm -hmm. spending $10,000 and getting $200, $200 more a month. And cap rates also compressed. So people could just sell them. And so, you know, you had this plan, but then instead of renovating 200 units, you only renovated 50 because you achieved all your like pro forma targets. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, and then, and then cap rates compressed and you were like, wow, we, again, we bought this thing for 20 million and it's worth 35 million. I guess we should sell it. Yeah. So it's, an, so let's jump into this John Burns piece, looking at total new apartments supply. And this is, I, you, you had some interesting no, notes in the show notes of, so really yeah. hoping that this, this would be more of a prescriptive, you know, kind of a how-to <laughs> guide and, and there's some bits and pieces, but it's, it takes a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe we, we have to buy some, buy some consulting it's, from John Burns. It's a good headline. Piece. It got a lot of clicks, you know, it, you, you click on the newsletter headline and you don't, it's not a measure of the quality of sometimes of the article, but this, this article did have a lot of quality. It just did not explicitly answer how to ride the, the apartment oh. supply wave. Yeah. It uh, it gets us close enough where we can connect the dots ourselves. But, you know, from an English teacher's perspective, I would say, you know what your thesis statement is. I don't know it. So you have to be a little bit more explicit. OK, yeah. OK, OK. <laughs> it's going to sound a little repetitive. It's going to sound doc the doctor uh, is, is in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor. Well, it's it's something I've said a lot before, and it's and it's good to know that 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 tendency is present at all levels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so what, what, but there's still a lot of it in this article. What, what are some of your main takeaways? And do we want to go to one of the first yeah. graphs? Or do you want to talk about some of these specific mar markets? Or um, just might as well, yeah, we graphs? can start at this first graph. The, the bot, the article starts out with an overview of the size of the new apartment wave that is expected, new apartment supply, I'm sorry. And there's an interesting graphic right here that you can see that ranks these major markets according to how many new apartment units were added last year and how many units are currently under construction? Wow. Yeah. Look at, I mean, look at Dallas, which obviously, you know, again, we've talked about this a lot, Matt. Dallas is a great growing market, a lot of new jobs, a lot of people moving there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they've added 20,000 units and 23 in, in planning on delivering, or there's 55,000 additional units that are under construction that'll deliver through 24, yeah. probably through 25 as well. That's a lot of units. For sure. I mean, it's a, Dallas is a big MSA, but... I mean, and so I'm, is and it's not growing like New York, but they're delivering quite a few more units in New York. And I actually am, I, I kind of can see the usefulness here of including the units under construction as well as last twelve months. And and you know, I could be persuaded. You could even include two thousand and twenty two. Yeah, just what well. every what the whole impact over like the recent time period has been. Because yeah, yeah because some of these, so like I'll just use Phoenix as an example. Of and and I, I'll have this later in the notes, so I'll repeat myself. I'm sure of these markets that they seem to catch fire really quick during the pandemic, and and it seems like multifamily builders moved in there. They didn't stop. They have not yet start, stopped yeah. building, and they won't stop building. And True. for markets for the kind of s relatively smaller markets, so I'm comparing Phoenix and and Austin to Dallas and New York. Though you know the small, the relatively smaller cities. They don't have the population that is as easy to absorb as a, the, a giant like megalopolis would would. And that's one of the shortcomings of this chart is it's a it's a raw numbers chart. Yeah, you don't see it's not you know, a percentage, but they do have a percentage chart if you go down. Yeah, but like, yeah. so so the implication is with both of these charts here, how to ride this apartment wave, so the apartment wave supply. Well, maybe avoid if you're an investor. Avoid the the markets that are uh, that are going to get a lot of supply, and specifically in this chart, it measures inventory growth uh, as a percentage, which is what I was looking for, uh, and then as a proxy for demand, it uses rent growth. Um, I I usually think of apartment demand as like absorption or occupancy, but that's fine. This is a new way of doing it, and that's fine. It's just it's just not my typical <laughs> rule of thumb. 
yeah, pick the right markets. They don't explicitly say it, but they do. But they do. Well, it's kind of what this is all about. To, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and and I, again, like it's like I can get it, but just say it. Can you just say it for me? Just say pick these markets. So on this graph, on on the I guess the the axis over here on the left, the vertical axis is apartment inventory growth, last 12 months deliveries divided by existing units. And then on the bottom, we've got apartment, we've got the rent growth, the year over year rent growth. Mm -hmm. And so again, there's a big cluster here kind of over on the far right with the US national average being your rent growth being, they have it like right, right around one instead of, you know, flat essentially. And the inventory growth kind of right around kind of two and a half and a kind of a decent cluster. Mm -hmm. But some of the outliers in terms of both kind of on the top left are markets you'd want to be worried about if they're building a lot of units, but also seeing negative rent growth. The biggest one would be Austin on, on this list where they've got around 6% um, new inventory growth relative to existing mm -hmm. supply. And they also have negative, you know, five and a half percent rent growth. Salt Lake City, also really high on new um, supply, above 7%, Nashville at 7%, and both of them also in negative territory, but, you know, closer to like negative two. Um, Jacksonville, also negative rent growth, strong supply, five and a half. Orlando, closer to four and a half with negative four and a half new supply with negative three and a half, sorry, 4% rent growth. Phoenix, Atlanta, Portland with a little less supply coming online. All, cons all, all, all concerning, and then the the, the markets that are, that are delivering the least, and as a relative to inventory, mm -hmm. like New York, which is delivering a lot of units. But again, New York's really big, so that makes yep. sense. But so we're so let's find Dallas. Because Dallas, I mean, again, that seemed like a lot of units, and it is on the top left of the main cluster of markets, with you know seeing basically three percent. New supply relative to existing inventory and, you know, basically negative, little more than negative 1% rent growth. Yeah. So it, it's not, it's not like good news for, for Dallas, but I guess it, it's not as extreme mm -hmm. the new supply compared to Austin, yeah. which isn't, isn't shocking really. Raleigh, Durham also, which has really been a poster child for like kind of a perfect market over the last five years or so yep. with the research kind of triangle. Mm -hmm. Good demographics, but just again, everyone saw the Carolinas as a great looking market and it's everyone can have the same good idea and it can turn the good idea into an average or, or even below average idea. Because again, if everyone makes the same bet, you know, the return mm -hmm. goes down, you drive the price up and the opportunity isn't there unless you're just, you're only looking at one metric, and that is migration and population growth. And yep. now what we were talking about earlier today, when discussing a deal that we're looking at right now, a great capital, is that it, it's, what's the net? You know, what, it's, it's like, what's the, the migration, the population growth, the job growth, you know, net of the demand in, or what, in, in supply? Mm -hmm. What is, it's not just supply, it's not just demand, like, what's the net of supply and demand? How many more units do you need relative to that of those that are in the market? So you'd be like, well, we need, you know, you know, there's four thousand. There's going to be four thousand units absorbed. That's a ton of people. But there's going to be four thousand people moving to this market. That's like, that's going to be great. That's a positive yep. sign. Mm -hmm. But logic would tell us that if you're building eight thousand units, yep. new units, mm -hmm. just because you have four thousand people that are coming, the households that are going to rent those units, you're still going to have negative rent growth and vacancy is going to go up. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's the net, and that's exactly what's happening in these markets. You've got tens of thousands of people that are going to be moving to some of these markets, mm -hmm. but you're building twenty thousand new units. Yeah. So it just do we build twice the amount of units in these? And, and most of these are all being the deliveries are being concentrated in some sub markets. It's not like they're evenly spread out across the nation or even in a city. It's yeah. like they're all in the same suburb or the same little neighborhood. It is interesting looking at, you know, where where things were built before and after. There really is a wave. And and elsewhere later in this John Burns this John Burns report, you see the permitting activity is a whole lot different than than the than the amount of apartments that were built. So like in some places, yeah, they built a lot and they're they're gonna complete a lot in 2024. But moving forward in the next few years, they're probably not gonna 
they're not going to complete a lot. They're, they're, the activity is going to really fall off a cliff. And, and they have a ranking here. And San Francisco has had their multifamily permits fall off the most, followed by Seattle and New York. And I bet that's compounding off of probably some previous years of permits declining in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. But there are, you know, there are others that are increasing, which is Yeah, insane. that was interesting to see. That was, that was interesting for me to see Miami, which has got a lot of new supply coming online. Yeah. It's uh, it's a whole other dynamic down there in South Florida, though. So and, and same, you know, San Diego, I think, is the same way that like, you know, it just has different dynamics, especially compared to San Francisco. It's completely different. And different from L.A. also, San Jose and Charlotte. Those are the four markets that are seeing permits go up. Charlotte, it would be a market that would concern me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, I agree. Because it, it's having some trouble right now. I mean, let's go back to. It's inventory growth. Let's let's find Charlotte real quick. Look Man. at the top. <laughs> Look at the top for for proportion of of Listen. supply. I don't know if it's on this little scatter how plot could, how here. How could uh, Charlotte not be on there? I uh, I agree rhetorically. Mm. Other other than maybe something. Maybe sp- it's overlapping. Yeah, I don't. Oh. Well, Question we can scroll up and the look editor. at the total. We can look. Oh, yeah. We can look up and see how. Oh yeah, much. here we go. Well, now again, this isn't relative to inventories, but you know they're they've got they're gonna they delivered just under fourteen thousand units last year. Assume that it's a lot, and we have uh, information that would corroborate that from the Fannie Mae report too. Okay. We'll yeah. Go. yeah. Okay. Well, let's look at the Fannie Mae report here in a minute. But they've got thirty three thousand units that are under construction. And Charlotte's a decent sized market, but that's a lot of units. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a that's a lot of. And I like how, you know, with these three kind of charts, they they look at, you know, where things have been and where things are right now, maybe in terms of rent growth and apartment supply. And then when it when you look at the permits is, you know, what are they going to be in the future? So if you want to ride this wave, you want to figure out where you're going to get on the wave and where yeah. you're going to land. Yeah. And and some of these markets come. I'll call out Miami specifically. I call you out Miami. <laughs> I think Phoenix to a certain extent and Charlotte to a certain certain extent. Their permanent activity and their previous building activity, they are still building units. And they're, you know, it has a, the construction activity has abated somewhat, but but not not a whole lot. Cities with the biggest with the biggest positive change again: Miami, San Diego, thirty six percent increase in permits; San Jose at twenty two percent; Charlotte, twenty two percent change; twenty two percent increase. Yeah. In permits, that's crazy. Yeah, and then wow. Salt Lake City was flat with the same permit, but the rest are negative. Yeah, um, they had a lot last year too. Crazy. So you know what's interesting too is if you look at the chart right here that we have, where this scatter plot are of the one Fannie Mae. Oh yeah, we can look at the Fannie Mae one. That's fine. I was, it was the similar information. If you look at the, if you look at the places that are adding the kind of least amount of new apartment supply, uh, by, as a percentage of current units. It's a lot of a lot of Midwestern markets. Those are the ones that that seem to have the strongest rent growth as well. And so you can see that that there's that correlation there. And those Midwestern markets are not the ones we'll go well for migration reports, but those are not the ones that are benefiting from migration. What they're benefiting from, at least from a, a multifamily investor's perspective, is a lack of supply. The reverse, the inverse to all of this discussion about strong markets and in all of these too. So like the economist's favorite markets, the renters, it's going to be renters' fav- or least favorite. So it's a benefit. Yeah. If you're living in Charlotte, great. Maybe your rents are, are going to come down. So these are, you know, this is definitely from the perspective of an investor and it's, it's useful a little bit for a reminder. So the difference between, I think, Matt, this chart in the last chart is this is taking a look at all of the units that are underway. Yeah. Which it, not instead of in the last chart, they broke out units that were delivered last year and then just 2024 expected completions versus all units underway could be 2024, 25, and yep. even 26 yep. scheduled deliveries. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I'm all kind of, because they're just calling it, yeah. you know, underway projects, multifamily units underway, because the there's a big difference in the units underway percentage of market units, which is, you know, goes up to, you know, the mid-teens versus on the uh, John Burns chart, it was... It's actually completed, yeah. Yeah, yeah they were completed and, yeah, it's completed over the last 12 months. And, I mean, the top, you know, Salt Lake City tops out at 7%. Versus again, you know, kind of Salt Lake City. Let's find Salt Lake City real quick. You know, that's closer to you know nine percent. And you know, we've got Charlotte here at you know fourteen and a half. That answers that question here, at least according to this chart. 
And then, you know, Dallas, I've got New York and Dallas flipped, because I think over the time period, it's more, but you can see the difference mm-hmm. between deliveries and percentage of inventory, you know, basically 4% versus, you know, six and a half. But again, you know, for Dallas, it's a lot of units, but, you know, that's much more healthy than, you know, again, Austin's that is basically, you know, up at 14. Mm-hmm. You know, Atlanta is basically on par with Dallas, right around 6%. But Matt, to you know, your your point, if you go down to some of these, you know, Midwestern markets like a Kansas City that's right around a little above four, or even Indianapolis, which is delivering more than some other markets for probably decent reason, but there's definitely gonna be some vacancy increases. Indianapolis right at five percent. Mm-hmm. You know, you got some really low delivery markets like LA, that makes sense, Chicago, that make that 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 mm-hmm. kind of makes sense too. San Diego kind of, you know, makes sense. Again, just not a lot of investment in California and Chicago and Detroit with really kind of coming down at the bottom, which, yeah. you know, I, I think that if there's a lot of tactical opportunities in Detroit, mm-hmm. you just have to be really careful getting in the right Yeah, there's a lot, sub-markets. a lot of, yeah, for sure. There's some, some really nice submarkets in Detroit and another, you know, another commonality, and I hate to say it again, but it is a lot of these Midwestern markets are the ones that they're not. Not really adding a whole lot of supply, whether it's raw numbers or percentage of supply. Another, you know, if we're covering Fannie Mae, which I think it's fine. Yeah, I, we're well, we're here, but we can we can uh, you know we 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 can come back. No, 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 no. We're here. We're here now. That's fine. And they're here. <laughs> they talked about they talked about riding the wave in in the John Burns piece, and and they say in the Fannie Mae piece that there is cl- a skies remain cloudy, and there's some turbulence there. So I think that maybe you know. I I prefer a nautical theme rather than like an aviation. It's theme. all weather. Yeah, it's a but, but it's weather. All weather. Is, yeah, you know, yeah. you have you know wave you know, heights. You know what, what what kind of how tall are the waves? Yeah, and you yeah, have, yeah. You know what's what's the cloud cover? It's all kind of yeah. yeah it's it's and, and weather conditions. Regardless of what, it's it's a little choppy. <laughs> it's a little choppy. <laughs> but just to be kind of uh to to get back to the report itself, it does cover very very similar stuff that we that we'll discuss elsewhere, and we have already just discussed with with John Burns. Huge amount of new supply expected. They give a report, they throw out the number 736 units slated for completion. They do qualify it and say, all right, it's not going to be that much, but still expect a lot. And they do say, though, that we'll get a healthy, maybe 440 or 424, 900, 424,902 units of multifamily demand. Very exact number for a, for a long-term, you know, 2024 expectation or projection there. But anyways, we also get a rent growth projection yeah. from Fannie Mae. And just because I like it so much when we get everything in one place, I want to just review all of the rent growth predictions that we've had and all ones we've covered here before. Starting with Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae says, we will get between 1% and 1.5% rent growth. Bercadia has before said 3%, CoStar 3.5%, Guardian Matrix 1.5%, Freddie Mac 1.2%, CBRE 1.2%, Cushman and Wakefield negative 2.5%. I'll never forget that one. Marcus and Millichap, one and a half percent. And the average of all these is 1.18%. And then my optimistic rent growth projection is a 2% that I just want to. And what, what made you land a 2% map? Because I know we, we've got the average there. So you, there's I some am additional so... thought analysis that goes into that. What's your, <laughs> what's your, but it, it's, a gut, said, it's a gut call. It's a gut call that there's not going to be a downturn as strong as people think. And that, e- that, the idea that instead of recession bringing down inflation, that there will it'll be a more, maybe a more higher for longer kind of issue mm-hmm. where it's jumping up every time, you know, yeah. every time there's a, a breath of lower interest rates. So, so that's. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for there to be more upside in mm-hmm. growth in 24 than I think most people would be projecting. Yeah. I, I can also make the case that it's flat in that 1% range or, you know, it basically just flat, but the, here's the challenge, because I think the demand is going to pick up mm-hmm. if we don't have a recession. But in some markets, in big markets, you just have so much supply, like as yeah. we've seen, that it's well, not going to really, there could be good demand, but there's going to be too much supply. And so it's really the different regions and markets, like as we've been talking the, about, they're going to stand out. The other assumption that I would say, well, to excuse myself for, for a 2% um, projection, is that maybe last year, the low rent growth was not just due to increased supply, but it was also a kind of reversion to the mean from the huge rent growth that we had in 2021 and 2022. Yeah. So yeah. if that is the case, you know, depending on how the magnitude of that, then we can come a lot closer to 2%. But if it was a story of supply, which it really could 
be, then maybe it is going to be closer to 1%. Especially if we have more supply coming online this yeah. year in 24 yeah. than we did last year in 23, which is yeah, what is projected. Really crazy. Again, just to, when we were looking at those markets, though, if we we're talking about winners and losers, wow, Huntsville expected to grow by over 16% and in Miami really leading it by adding more than 70, 17% yeah. to its apartment That's unit a lot. Yeah. After Huntsville is Charlotte, expected to increase by about 15%. And then Austin, Texas, with about that same amount of increase. Charlotte is that notable market. And I think I mentioned this before because it, it is a top-ranking market in, in some of those you know, lists that, that, I'll, that I'll review here in a second. Yeah. It seems like they're building all the time. Like I, I remember visiting, yeah, you know, know a decade know and a half. Yeah. And like there's always, they were building stuff there. They're still building now. And it's just... Yeah, I mean people. I mean people are moving there. Yeah, they, yeah. And, and they need to build. They they yeah. need to build. I mean that it's just how much. Like yeah. obviously we know. Like if you build a million units, it's too mm -hmm. many units. How many? How much and, is too much? And that's what the interesting thing is. Like for e even I guess even for Huntsville, it's like these aren't going to be empty cities. You know, cities no. full of empty apartments. No, no, buildings, the, but... no. The, it'll get absorbed. It's just yeah. going to take some time. And since deliveries are going to slow down in twenty six, there's going to be that period of mm -hmm. where it's all going to get absorbed yeah. and we still, and we need to build more units mm -hmm. and just we're delivering a lot in a concentrated period of time. Yeah. It's this, it's this wave. And that's, what's interesting is to see the momentum of multifamily supply, how some of these markets, it, these like kind of charismatic markets like Austin and Phoenix, maybe not so yeah, much, Huntsville, but, yeah. but like they, they really capture. Boom the, I mean, they're the boom yeah, towns. Yeah. And, and so they moved in there like, and these builders are probably rightfully so confident, but in the short term, it's going to lead to a lot of, of turbulence. I agree. But, you um, know, surf that wave. Yeah. 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 Tubes that are, what, what hang loose? I, I said, I put in brackets in my notes. I said, insert surfer slang here and then i never followed up and oh, actually yeah. inserted the surfer slang so i think i should have said like wicked gnar or Lo something yeah 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 hanging gnar locals only <laughs> so that's what yeah that's what here's my closing comments for the john burns pieces was how, so how are we going to ride this wave well you should factor in how much supply that the markets experienced in the past look at permits for a sense of future growth and you know the next thing you know you're barreling down a wicked gnar down a tube, man, the ocean's behind you and in front of you. I don't know. I fucking... Thank you for that. I really messed up the lingo there. No, that was great. I wanted to share with you some shorthand information that I I went down a, you know, hours long rabbit hole. Maybe it, maybe it felt like hours. I was doing a lot of Excel math and I was looking at permits, looking at starts, looking at a, and comparing them to deliveries. So, and... And I was looking for kind of a rule of thumb, and, and my math could be way off, but I, I did look at, so if you looked at the amount of construction starts two years prior, there, it, to get a good idea of deliveries today, there, it's about 1% off. So if, so if once you start it, you're almost certainly going to, 99%, it's going to be complete, which makes sense. You start spending yeah, the yeah. money, and it's that, permitted. The relationship it's between titled. those two numbers, you yeah, know, they're, yeah. it's obviously, they're different ones that are, but. But the way that there's it all no, shakes yeah, out, not a big variance. There's a little bit of, yeah, there, you know, not a big variance. There's a little bit of swing either way, but essentially, you know. Yeah. Once it starts, it's going to be nailed down. In the at least in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And for permits, it was, and, and again, it's like, I don't know, maybe my math's wrong. The amount of permits issued in one quarter, skip two years later after that, that same quarter, two years later, it's, you got to subtract 80%. So, so the permits are what, uh, eighty percent, or like basically five times greater than the amount of actual deliveries that happen two years. Five after. times, so only twenty percent of the permits get delivered. Yes, yes, yeah. And I mean that's how the and and it's not like th that's just the relationship between the two numbers. And that, and that makes sense because I mean you might get something permitted, but you know it doesn't just because you get a permit doesn't mean the deal makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, for all, but I, I would say that, yeah, because you don't have to, and... it doesn't, it, like, if you're actually under construction, then, you know, that seems like a very, a, a lot bigger. And then the final one is, if you are, like they did in John Burns, looking at the number of apartments under construction in any given quarter. So if you do that two-year thing that I said, so two years ago, how many apartments were under construction? 16%. So about 16%. Of the of the apartments under construction are will you know will be delivered two years later or you know are associated with. Some are going to be delivered three years later. Yeah, some three, yeah. some one. 
Yeah. And your and the deliveries. And if you kind of think about it, and if you're talking about the the whole number of apartments under construction in any one quarter, well, you times that by eight or whatever, because you're thinking about two year, you know, two year mm -hmm. timeline to complete. So that slice is up roughly proportional to the amount. But it's good to have yeah, a that, you know that, have that, a little that's rule good. Of there. That, that, that's good to know. I appreciate that. And I don't think a lot of the listeners knew that. I'll get some corrections. I really, well, I really want some corrections because I want to know a rule of thumb. You, I look at these permits. It starts all the time. They're like, well, look about that. Well, I want to know, is there a back of the napkin where well, cut that by a third and then you'll yeah. good prediction. Yeah. And I'm sure obviously the market can change between, you know, yeah. if it's a, like right now looking at the permits versus the actual, you know, deliveries, mm -hmm. that there's going to be a fall off. You may have gotten a permitted in 21 or 22 yeah. but then all of a sudden 2023 interest rates are different like i'm not building that right now i got a permit for it but if you looked at that same data from mm -hmm. you know 20 2020 or 20, 2019 to 2021 like i think you see a much higher percentage of properties that are completed so it'd be worth yeah, looking yeah. at that same data was, for different some some different periods that, different and that's a really good point too an average. because there was a there's a definite a rolling average stretch and push and compression around the pandemic. Yeah, it's a crazy time yeah, yeah. period. And we're still working through it a little. Still, yeah, so, yeah, no, we are. It's just just cruising back in over this Fannie Mae piece, Matt, yeah, um, yeah. is they're breaking out national effective rent growth. Again, national, it's so market dependent, but look, breaking out A, B, and C, and this is getting into some of the income demographics where you might want to start looking at allocating. The C-class rents are holding up more so than B and A class. Yeah. There's, there's There's been a decline across the board starting they, in- Second quarter of Q2. And but. they seem to have held up. You know, if you look yep. over even throughout the history that they they outline here, they are the most stable when it comes to downturns. They don't dip as low as the other ones yeah, at, kinda, at any it, point. It really almost looks like, yeah, it looks like a like a rolling average between the two. Almost. Yeah. It's kind of cut right in the middle and being much more stable, which, which, which is interesting. Now, I think that what doesn't, is not baked into this is... You're also seeing more collections and delinquency issues and bad debt and mm. C-class properties. It's a little bit more across the board, but more C-class properties than others, which, you know, rent growth, yeah, you can raise the rent, but that doesn't mean anyone's paying the rent. So if I think if you took that net, you may be closer, although the class A and B, there's a lot of concessions going on around I right I was, now. That's, so that's what I not. wondered too. They they dumped all this nice well, shiny A class that competes with the B class. C class is a little independent. But. Yeah, and again, here we go. With concessions. You can see A is always higher because you're trying to, you know, incentivize people to pay a little bit higher. Those new that new construction, and you know, there's been a tick up recently, including C class. To be honest, B and C are right at the same. But you can see mm -hmm. A class is still, you know, it's kind of flat right around five and a half percent. A little tick up. I could see this. I'm surprised it hasn't ticked up more. To be honest. Yeah. But I mean. But it relatively the percent of that's that's the concession rate. How much of a discount? But how many units mm -hmm. are actually doing? So the the rate of concession hasn't really ballooned up. Yeah. But the amount of units offering concessions. I mean, look at this, Matt. I mean, and, and this is very uniform. I mean, fewer of Class C, but everybody was like, "What is going on? We need to you know start to maintain occupancy because vacancies are increasing. We're not getting the rent growth. Like, are we raised?" Everyone's like, maybe our rents are too high. Everyone went Bad. quickly from being like, oh my gosh, we we're behind raising rents. The the property across the street is charging this, and you know we're, we're three months. We our rents have been like two hundred dollars below market. Like this is crazy. And so everyone raised their rents two hundred fifty dollars. Was there? Yeah. Let's get ahead of it. And then everyone's like, we can't afford that. Uh, because everything else has gone up, and there are a thousand new units that were just delivered in my neighborhood. So yeah. like the Class A P folks. They're offering me a concession, and the price is the same as the Class B. Why would I move to a Class B? So everyone's like, let's offer these concessions. Mm -hmm. And there's really lockstep. And I mean, now almost 20% of all multifamily units are offering concessions in the four to, you know, almost 6% range. Yeah, it's crazy to, it's crazy to see the uptick in, in concessions at the start of the pandemic that really didn't approach to the mean until the second quarter of 2021. Yeah. And it, then it goes down and it's like this, this perfect counter reaction. It's like, well, it's because heartbeat. everyone was, everyone was like, oh my gosh, you know, lockdowns, no one has jobs. And yeah. so we need to like, you know, give people a break. And, but what ended up happening is everyone got, you know, some checks from the, some yeah. stimmy, some stimmy, <laughs> stim, stimmies. 
and yeah. we were able to float themselves and occupancy shot up. So it wasn't really necessary and, and probably led to a lot of the inflation that we're, we've been witnessing today. Yeah. So it's like everyone that got the 500,000, whatever it was, 500, per, what was it? 500 per person? I don't remember. It was something. Wonderful. It was. It was whatever a lot. it was. It was, it was amazing. Like, this is great, but you know that, and everyone has ended up paying much more than that back in inflation yeah. Yeah. over the last two years or so. Multifamily supplies expected to peak in 2024. Thank goodness. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. So they have this. You know, they have uh, a lot of. I really like this graph here. It says the, the multifamily apartments underway again. It's not the percentage. But they have these, a combination, like, like I was looking for before, where they combine 2022, 20, 23, and 24. And then beyond, they have as a category too. But you can see in a, you know, I guess it's, it's not percentage, but as even in the raw numbers, how much of a proportion of apartments are expected to be completed in 2024 for a place like Dallas, the amount of, the amount of units built in last year and the year before together. That may be about the same as are going to be built this so year. So, you know, the the saying survive till 25, you know, rings true. Yeah. That if we can get through this, you know, supply wave that's going to be going on through 2024, mm -hmm. not that someone's seep into 25, but 25 is going to be starkly different. Is that, is that a yellow, orange color? The top um, is the, green, yeah. yeah the lightest color is the one that's the beyond. Yeah. And and that's usually the smallest category for all these. Yeah. But that, yeah. what is, you know, the kind of nightmare scenario or, or, or at least like a dramatic way of, of talking about the supply in 2024 is, well, combine 22 and 23. That's how many new units yeah. we'll get. Yeah. Now, it, it's true for certain markets, not true for others, but it's not that far off base. No. When we looked at this chart already, many mm -hmm. markets oversupplied. Select markets with higher expected 2024 unemployment, or sorry, employment growth. So, you know, there's some surprise for empl employment. You know, again, again, this is where there are really good metrics, but again, in a vacuum, mm -hmm. they can be misleading because... And they're the metrics that are often the ones most talked about as being the most important. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's maybe led some folks astray. And it's, but it's not that they're wrong. It's just that there's more than one data point that you have to look at. And again, it comes back to what is the, what is yeah. the net effect of all of supply and demand? Mm -hmm. Honolulu has had some horrible fundamentals. Other, you know, they've got really strong of uh, employment growth. Houston is one of the market where we're seeing deals blow up day by day. Mm -hmm. It's been marked as the market that's probably going to see the highest level of distress. And same with Orlando and Austin, Boise City. Again, it's going to be fine eventually, but that's a yeah. great. You know, that's going through some turbulent times. Salt Lake City, Raleigh, Phoenix. Dallas, Jacksonville, Memphis, you know, th these are, this is the same list of worrisome markets relative to. Well, yeah, because, you know, online. they've Again, got. Look at the, look at the comparison of this list. Yeah, because they've got employment growing at 1.2% or, or so in Austin, let's say. And then you scroll up, you, well, okay, let's see how many percenting, how much new supply is going to come. Well, that's much, much more than 1.2%. It's like, what, 15%. So. That's the that's the deficit here. We're talking about a factor of ten and again, difference. And again, it's like look, look, looking at a company that's got a ton of revenue and judging them only based on the revenue without asking or looking at how much are you spending. Yeah. And being well, we're you know yeah we're bringing in a billion dollars a year of revenue. Well, how much are you spending? Two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. We're losing a billion dollars. So it, it it's with if you look at just the first piece of data. It's, well, what could go wrong? A billion dollars. That's enough to get a lot of things done. Like you're probably yeah. making hand over the fist. Some people may even think that you're making a billion dollars. Yeah. No, you're, you're literally only looking at half of the picture. That and math may have worked in 2019, but. <laughs> and, that, and, and it's, and it, exactly, it did work. There are companies that could yeah, be, yeah. you know, just look at our, look at our top line revenue or mm -hmm. multiple on revenue. And the, we're no longer, no, everyone's not, we're getting off the pixie dust. It's like, you know, we've yeah, had yeah. to go through a period of withdrawal from free money and, you know, 0% interest rates, mm -hmm. but we're getting out this period of, of withdrawal and seeing how the economy and deals work and like. A real economy with real interest rates and, yep. you know, things that are sort of working like the textbooks sort of say that they might suggest. We're getting away from being like, oh, yeah, modern monetary theory. We can just inflate, yep. print as much money and there's no repercussions. Just may raise taxes a little bit. 
Yeah. Well, I hear many people talking about modern monetary theory these days. It's an exciting theory, though. Yeah, I, I think people were excited that they, they were like, they're like, so see, good. it is mad. They're, they're, like, they're, like, they're, they're like, the magic does work. Yeah, yeah, that's if right. If you believe. If we all believe, that's why. <laughs> yeah, in which like there's something sort of to that. But yeah. then again, it's like, okay, oh, the gravity, it's, it's here. Yeah, yeah. And not enough people believe. You know, any, any other good takeaways no, I just, on, in this report or I, I, I want to move just, on to the next? Uh, you know, interest we rates, cap rates. Okay, so this is a or this no, is a not, really not revealing. Important. No, no, no. Let's just glance at this, okay? Because there was a lot in this, a lot in this report where that I, you know, I my eyes went directly to the markets and the supply story because that's the story that I wanted to tell during this episode. But we also did touch just now, you know, earlier in a second ago, we talked about the cap rate spread in that Siri analyst thing, and and it's dramatic here. You can see just at a glance how close the cap rate and 10-year treasury spread has been. Not only, not only like in the past, you know, a few months, but like even since March or I'm sorry, since like January of 23, it's really entered a new a kind of a new era of very slim gap. Yeah. Well, and that that was the run up in the 10-year treasury, yeah. you know, that when it brushed 5% and and and, the, and again, this chart only goes to November 23 and the, you know, the obvious the Treasury True. has come down. Well, it was below four percent. It was above four percent. You know, earlier this week, it's it's call it four percent. You know, plus, plus mm-hmm. or minus. But that, but to your point, man, that doesn't that that spread is still historically tight. Well, uh, and now what this graph isn't showing, and I, I don't know where they're getting their cap rate data from. Where where is it? They're saying as, yeah. as Federal Reserve, select interest rates per Moody's Analytics, MSCI real okay, MSCI real assets where they're getting their cap rate data. We know the cap rate data is pretty bad all over the board, and I I can just tell you this right now. Oh, yeah, I mean they're basically saying cap rates got down to five percent. Yeah, and we know that they got down to four and a half percent. Yeah, so there's there's a good a hundred base. So because they were in, they were inverted, all this negative leverage, like there there was definitely some inversion. Of people doing, oh um, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, cap rates much lower than their interest rates, and even lower than the ten-year treasury. And the ter- treasury is what it is. And what so- is what is interesting, though, just looking at this, is how volatile the ten-year treasury is related to cap rates. Seems so stable, it, even it, and and so it's really what moves the spread so much more than cap rates moving is the treasury moving. There, it did seem, you know, if you go all the way back to November of of 2008, it does seem like, well, finally, there was a kind of equal, a, a commensurate uh, movement between yeah. the 10-year and cap rates where they both j- jagged down. But outside of that moment specifically, forever, is is when is the 10-year treasury will go down, cap rates will stay well, the same. I, I think, you know, you make two good points, Matt. One is that typically in a kind of a normal non- event-driven, crisis, recession-driven mm-hmm. environment, cap rates do generally, you know, just are slow moving and it's been on the slow direction downward in the same general direction of uh, that interest rates. And it's not like, again, like we talked about, it's not a one-for-one for one, but interest rates and generally were moving down and in cap rates much more steadily were moving dra- down. Mm-hmm. But they did move quickly. And this is the second point that you made yep. during the great financial crisis. You know, cap rates very quickly, you know, kind of dropped down as things got crazy. And then they shot up very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then they receded down kind of over time. But it's a pretty quick. And I think that what this graph is missing is that that little lump up that has taken place over the last mm-hmm. three, four months or mm-hmm. so, where I think, you know, cap rates are at six or above. And then, you know, the 10 year treasury is down at four. So, I mean, we had this little yeah. sp- spike up here. And now it's going to go back, um, going to go back, most economists would say it's going to go back down. But that being said, I think that there's still a, definitely a chance where that we could get back up to four and a half percent, maybe not five percent, but the 10-year treasury could get, go a little, run a little bit higher if there's some new inflation fears. Again, yeah. I think the, the main yeah. worry card for me, it would be the the geopolitics and the you know, potential mm-hmm. war in the Middle East. I mean, I think, you know, not to... Yeah, yeah. Talk about that specifically, but I mean, we are, I mean, there's a full on like air campaign across Middle East right now that the United yeah. States is involved in. I mean, yeah. we're bombing Yemen and Iraq and, and mm-hmm. Syria. We're in like a very big, almost a war with Iran. So, like, what are those consequences? 
And it's hard not to imagine energy prices going up just because it's, it's like they've been so low, uh, yeah, unreasonably a low. Price, price, you would you would think but, that it, that would I mean, you would think that energy prices would already be spiking. Maybe people yeah. are just just they're kind of just numb to it all and like yeah yeah we're yeah World War Three. It's been on the books for a while now. So. Well, you know we're domestic oil production has gone up significantly. We may be we may be a producing more oil than ever that before. we are that that, that um, is true so is true. you know that, that's one thing but but i i, I just th think it's interesting how and and the connection between cap rate and treasury movement and how it does seem like maybe sometimes it looks like there's a year and a half lag between cap rates and interest rate movements but yeah well that's what we've seen i mean yeah. interest interest rates went up and cap rates have taken a year yeah for more to move okay yeah. matt some quick hits let's get into this real page right. piece oh um, actually can we can we look at the apartment list oh That'll, let's go to real we can quick lump, hit piece from apartment list yeah, we can lump um, in real page too so well uh, awesome yeah let, let's uh, jump in we'll, we'll bring us up to All speed right, so, with renter migration here's what i think happened we put out a great episode of gray report yeah, last we, week yeah. we covered migration report from three separate sources alongside several other reports trying to find the next hottest city in terms of migration now this year or i'm sorry this week we are looking at supply but my my guess is that apartment list and and real page they watched our 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 episode last week and they quickly realized they need to write their own migration reports yeah, and sure. that means that we couldn't include them last week but i wanted to put them in here and so right off the bat yeah. this report from apartment list is actually really useful because it covers major multifamily markets that weren't covered by the other migration reports two out of three of them just talked about states and that's fine but I yeah, did but, some... but again, if you if you're in a state where like you have a metro that's growing, yeah. then like some of the counties aren't. You can yeah, it's again real estate's so local. And this has some detailed information about where where people are moving from and into for for every you know for a given market. So you know who is where all the people that are interested in Louisville. Well, where are they coming from? Are they coming from Nashville or Atlanta or Tampa? You know, and so they had that breakdown, but they also have a list of rankings of the of the markets with the most out of market search interests. So this isn't like van lines and U-Haul and stuff. They they looked at, you know, they use their data of, of people renting the trucks and stuff. Well, the data from apartment lists are who's going into their website and searching for different markets where they live somewhere, somewhere different. Yeah. Very common. So I like this. This map stuck out to me specifically. So they have a little bit of a colored chart and they show, yeah, the migration, the interest is in the Sunbelt and in these mountain markets like Idaho and Montana. Also Maine, too. Interestingly, Maine was common yeah, through, yeah, through the yeah. other migration reports. So and, and now I, I will take this opportunity to run through all of these. And it, just like I collected the rent growth, here are the top markets. Quick hits. And, and here we go. So Atlas Van Lines had Maine, North Carolina, New Hampshire, Montana, Washington. U-Haul had Texas, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. Again, Sunbelt. United Van Lines, shh, they actually had markets. I, I was able to find this. This was a third one yeah. we didn't include last time, but I had to, I, I don't know if, if you've seen this. I had to, I, I put a last minute update in, I spliced it into the video for a minute where I had to recover it because we were referring to Atlas Van Lines as United Van Lines. So I want to flag that too. That's a quick correction if you didn't see that. Mm. But they did it because I mislabeled it and I kept it kept mislabeling it through the whole thing. And okay. I was just blind. Building. It was, yes. And I, I put myself, throw myself at the mercy of our viewers and the court, I guess. United Van Lines, top markets, Charlotte, Indianapolis, Tampa, Nashville, Raleigh, Durham. Okay. And so this is where we're getting some really interesting stuff yeah. here. Zillow, hot housing markets, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Columbus, Indianapolis, Providence. So Indianapolis, you're, you're going to hear that more. It's Apartment cool. list, the, as I said, most out of market search interest. Raleigh, Durham, Charleston, Lakeland, Florida, Stockton, California, Cape Coral, which is Fort Myers, Colorado Springs. I speculate my speculation for this apartment list one is these places like like Lakeland, Florida, Stockton, California, in a little bit, you know, a little bit maybe Fort Myers. These are markets. They're not the suburbs, but they are like a secondary city. It's a little bit far, a little bit far from. A little bit inland, maybe from San Francisco, yeah, or whatever. Uh, so yeah. it, it's it, and maybe you know these people. It, it could be affordability. It's like, well, you know how uh, it'd be like me saying, well, how much would it cost to live in Kokomo, Indiana? That that kind of thing. And maybe maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I think affordability is a concern. And that was something that it makes sense. I mean, yeah. it's been an inflationary environment. People are at least more conscious yeah. of it, of like, I've got to figure this out. And, you know, potential recession, at least that's been the mindset the last year. And people are thinking about, hey, I got to at least be thinking about 
my the bottom line and my budget and yeah. and, and again this work from home trend of like hey how do i mm-hmm. have this arbitrage this work and you know living arbitrage yeah. of like what's the cheapest place i can live mm-hmm. and still make the most amount of money working from anywhere yeah yeah and and again that's where affordable markets that maybe even a little bit more tertiary outside of the main metro it's mm-hmm. when people are like you know what what do i actually do you know if you're outside of your like yep. early mid 20s and you're like what do i actually like do I don't go out to bars, mm-hmm. you know, I, I like to go out to eat occasionally, but I don't need like a million restaurants. Mm-hmm. And maybe that means that it's like the town that I live in needs to have some food options and some shopping options. Yeah. And I just need to be in relative proximity to, you know, a, a medium sized city. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's a flip side to the Zoom towns, you know, to a place yeah. like Boise or, or you know. Which those are expensive. They're they're cheaper than maybe San Francisco, but like now they are that's what I mean. very yeah, expensive yeah. still. So you can you can remote work at some a place with a mountain in the background, pay up for it. Yeah. Or alternatively, you know, your remote work where where you can afford it. I was listening to a podcast. It was a the- Theo Vaughn's podcast, yeah. and he was this was a couple of weeks ago, and he was interviewing this girl who she's like a tattoo artist and she, anyway yeah. she'd been living in LA and <laughs> she'd been on one of the tattoo reality TV shows I don't know love it but anyway all the reason I say this is she and her family moved to she didn't say what town it was mm-hmm. in Indiana yeah like right on the on the Ohio River oh okay small like she, like a very small town mm-hmm. like you know hardly even like a street light yeah because it was like super cheap and it's like I don't need all the stuff that is in like I I, I don't do people fly to her like She's a tattoo artist. I don't, I think she, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, okay, I didn't go into her whole story. about working in the tattoo world. How yeah, that? I don't think that works. I think she's doing other, I think she's made money from the TV show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, I, I think she probably, I think she said just she still flies into LA okay, like okay. once a month or so to yeah. do stuff. And, you know, it probably makes enough money per whatever. Yeah, yeah. That, but still, any, living any, on the anyway, anyway, this whole idea is that yeah. like, look, I can be, again, we're living in a different world today than even five years ago, 10, 20 yeah. years ago. Mm-hmm. You can be connected. Yeah, I mean, again, like we've, there's Starlink, there's satellite internet, there's broadband being expanded to more mm-hmm. rural communities. Obviously, more of that needs to happen. But like you can get the internet yeah, and you can be fully connected yeah. and you can have meetings. Everyone's used to doing Zoom meetings, remote meetings. You can hop on a plane if you need to meet in person. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's crazy the amount of times like I'm, you meet someone local at a conference at a state. It's like, well, we're local, but we haven't gotten together because we know we can always get together and we never take the time. But then like, yeah, you know, yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, we're going to go like I'm going to be next week in California and San Diego at NMHC. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like we're getting together with a couple of local people that I'm like, I don't know why we haven't gotten together locally, but yeah, we're just yeah. going to happen to be there. And there's a reason to mm-hmm, do it. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's so you don't need to get together in person, although some, you know, in per, you can't it's hard to replace many in person meetings. Okay, yeah. Matt. Yeah, if we want to real page, to, yeah, real page. So then uh, we got uh, quick. Real hits. page has their own lightning round. Yeah, yeah. They have their own list of their top markets. Most promising for for them is Boston, followed by Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, New York. Now they have other groups here, and but I want to. Article. It's a graphic that is not loading. <laughs> it's right there. It is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so yeah, Boston. These are early favorites to lead, which are Boston, Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, New York. They have a category surprising upside with uh, Houston, San Diego, San Jose, Washington, D.C. And, and it kind of goes on from there. But I wanted to stick with their top markets here and kind of have some co- summative comments about the markets that were shared among all of these lists, whether it's Atlas, Van Line, Zillow, Apartment List, Real Page, whatever. Yeah. Be- Commonalities, you, Columbus, Ohio came up in a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Raleigh, Durham, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Chicago, and Boston. I'm including in Chicago and Boston because those actually showed up uh, showed up in a positive way in the in the John Burns data as well. Yeah. They just weren't called out specifically. So of those, Columbus, Ohio and Raleigh Durham really look like the top of the top here, with several reports in agreement on the strength and demand prospects of these markets. But Raleigh Durham is getting a lot of new supply. So that really leaves us with I think the clear winner is Columbus, Ohio in terms of, you know, the popularity among these economists and and housing projectors and multifamily. So yeah, buy it, buy in Columbus. That's yeah. the that, yeah. that's where to. Put. And and again, it it comes back to you know you know skate where the puck is going, not where yeah. it is. And just because the dynamics are good right now doesn't mean yeah. Even though it's like a program might be seeing headwinds right now because the supply doesn't mean it's not going to be set up for great performance in the next coming years. Yeah, as supply slows down. Yeah. 
Well, you know, this entire episode sponsored by Gray Capital and our next upcoming investment opportunity open for accredited investors. We can't really share too many details right now other than we are in the process of moving forward with a pending acquisition currently under LOI letter of intent. It's an exciting opportunity. Again, can't share that much otherwise, other than it's the I mean, it's the most exciting deal oh, that I've seen. I can share something too. in general. Okay, okay. It's the, it's the kind of dynamics that we're talking about with supply and, yeah. and you know, the strength of markets, even maybe some of the regions that we were talking about. I don't know. Yeah. We're talking well, about every single region, so well, I feel it comes safe down there. To, it, it, we'll, we'll give a preview. It's a market that mm-hmm. doesn't jump off the page in terms of population growth. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the net demand in supply... It becomes very positive and compelling, yeah. like overwhelmingly compelling. Yeah. But if I only looked, like I have only looked at the revenue, if I only looked at population growth, I probably would have taken it off the list. Mm-hmm. But I look at absorption when I look at the new supply coming online or the la- almost no new supply and then get in the details of like the income demographics and the needs of housing, yeah. the amount of units they're going to need over the next five years. Mm-hmm. And like there's no new units coming online and you need like 2,800 units. Yep. And then again, the income growth in that area, it's... It, so we're, we're going to be sharing a lot of these details. Make If you want to be informed when we have a deal, you hop on over. We need to request access to the Great Capital Investment Portal, which you can find at greatcapitalllc.com. Click on New Investor, sign up. You can just request access. We'll get around to you within a day. And you can schedule a meeting with anyone, a member of our investment team, and get you queued up for, to get all the information. Because it, it's, it's one of those... I think it's the it's a deal that's going to go pretty quick. Man. Yeah. Like we don't know. It's a weird capital raising environment. The equity markets are strange, but the, it's it, it's the the reason one of the reasons why it's compelling is that you know it's hard to get the returns in today's market, yep. and we want to see a little bit more return for the risk of a little of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Even though we're getting out of that uncertainty period a little bit, but the returns justify all the risk. Yeah, and it checks all the boxes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we can't wait. So hop on over to the website, check it out, get in touch with us again. Yeah, this isn't an offer to invest, and any offering is going to only be open to accredited investors. Make sure you consult with your own investment advisors, and you know if you are interested, make sure you read the full PPM of conversation with us and others. Like this video, give us a comment. Yeah, give give us give Matt some hate. Give us some hate yeah, for yeah. the wrong. Did I do um, the math right? <laughs> yeah, and then the, you questioned yourself too much, Matt. I don't know. No I, one, I no one would question the math if, unless if you <laughs> questioned yourself. So yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you need to come up, be confident. Anyway. Thanks for watching this episode. It's been a great time spending with y'all. See you on the next one.